Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Neoliberal Podcast, part of the Center for New Liberalism. I'm your host, Jeremiah Johnson, and my guest this episode is Noah Smith. Noah, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me back on. So, Noah, you are one of the writers that I follow that I feel like does the best job describing what's going on in some of the Pacific Rim countries. You write a lot about development and trade and a couple of these countries in particular are, are really interesting, whether it's Malaysia or South Korea or Taiwan or Japan. So I'm really excited to kind of have a chance to just sit down and talk about what's going on in the region there and, you know, how U.S. trade and, and U.S. foreign policy is impacting these places and, and what the future of some of these places looks like. So I, I, do you have an approach, I guess, when you, you look at all these places, obviously, like you've lived in Japan but what makes you – let me start here, actually. What makes you interested in this region so much that you write about it so frequently and, and you're talking about their development and their foreign policy? And is there something in particular that draws you to kind of this Pacific Rim area? Well, a couple things. I mean, there's the obvious fact that I lived in Japan. So if I write about Japan, that's probably just because I specifically care about it because I lived there and will probably live there again. Um, so it's kind of my home away from home, and therefore I care about it extra much. The same is not true of like China, for example. I never intend to live in China. Um, and I have no special affinity for China or, you know, et cetera, any other real country in that area. It's just economically important. I mean, China is the world's biggest economy by, you know, all the measures that really matter. You know, it's super important. It's the world's biggest manufacturer. And it's also the the site of this geopolitical rivalry. Uh, you know, China versus the developed democracies. And it's it's this, you know, contest that we haven't really seen, uh, at least in my lifetime and, you know, far before probably. And so it's it's economically incredibly important, geopolitically incredibly important. So I'd say that's really what it is. It's, it has nothing to do with any sort of personal uh, thing except for when I write about Japan. You know, as you were answering, it, it struck me that there's probably a, a very simple answer for why so many people are fascinated by this part of the world. And that is that, you know, it's where everyone lives <laughs> and in just very right. simple terms. So probably like a third of the world population is is either China or Southeast Asia or Japan or kind of the, the countries in, in very close proximity to that. If you expand a little bit to like Indonesia and, and Myanmar and you know, not even having to go as far as the, the Indian subcontinent, which obviously also like that's where the people are. So obviously that's where like a bunch of big, important world changing events are going to be happening. Right. Right. I also think it's interesting because, you know, some of the some of the most important examples of industrialization have happened there. We think of it, you know, one of the things I'm most interested in myself is kind of this process of like, how do countries get rich? And, you know, why are some countries rich and some countries are poor? And this is something you write about a lot. And obviously, the first example of that is always you got to talk about Britain and the Industrial Revolution, and how that spread to America and the Netherlands and so forth. And, and that's it's a worthy topic to think about the Industrial Revolution and how it happened. But it was a pretty straightforward spread from you know, its origins in the UK to just the countries that were near it. And then also the United States, which was culturally very close. And then it didn't really spread like the Industrial Revolution didn't spread very well outside of Europe until we got this kind of second wave of industrial like industrialization, big success stories in the Pacific Rim, South Korea and Japan, and, and then later on China. Is there something right. about the region itself? Like, what do you think makes them the second great success story of industrialization? Well, that's a great question. Um, I would say that no one really knows. And there's a theory by Paul Krugman and Masahisa Fujita and Anthony Venables that says that basically industrialization will spread from region to region, uh, you know, as sort of as the economy grows and our need for an ever increasing variety of goods grows, uh, you know, more and more places will be industrialized and each, each region or country will industrialize faster than the ones before it. And it's just sort of this natural process. And I kind of do think that something like this is going on. Um, although it's very hard to validate, obviously those theories with data, 
But it, if you look at how the world works, it sort of looks like that. Um, Japan was obviously way out in front of the rest of East Asia. You know, Japan started industrializing in the late 1800s, which was not that long after the European countries started to industrialize. Um, you know, the I would say Japan is just a little bit behind Germany, really, in terms of industrialization. Germany initially zoomed ahead and Japan's industrialization was slower after uh, after World War II. Uh, Japan really zoomed ahead and then became, you know, sort of the Japan we know today. And then, and I would say starting in the late 60s some other countries around the pacific rim you know very small countries started industrialized like south korea taiwan etc and so then basically china was the really big one you know east asia is almost all china you know japan has what 120 million people china has 1.4 billion people like china is almost all of east asia by population and um and so really when we're talking about the industrialization of east asia it's the industrialization of china which really began in the 80s, uh, you know, after Maoism was repudiated, etc. And what's interesting is that people had been sort of predicting this massive industrialization of China for quite some time and been working on it. People had been working on this in the 1800s, and it just wasn't happening. It didn't take, partly because of instability and war in China, and partly, possibly just because the uh, the agglomeration effects hadn't become big enough yet. But then, uh, you know, by the by the late 20th century, it was certainly ready and so Deng Xiaoping is the big, uh, you know, prime mover here. He said, OK, we're getting rid of Maoism. We're going to liberalize the economy. And essentially, all they really did at the beginning was liberalize. So East Asia has a reputation for being very heavy on industrial policy. But it turns out that industrial policy is sort of a patch that you do when stuff's just not happening naturally on its own. And so China's industrial policy was primarily at the local and regional level during the 80s, 90s and 2000s. You know, a, a province of China would woo various companies and would say, we're going to be the number one province in auto parts. And, and you know, then they would give some incentives, usually in the form of cheap land and cheap financing and cheap energy. Is this also when, uh, when like, Shenzhen uh, became kind of a special district and started, you know, they started building that out from a fishing village, basically, into, into like, we want to make it a, an international trade zone and manufacturing and stuff like that? Yes, but, there's a but there. Uh a lot of Shenzhen has, uh, you know, development has also been due to the national industrial policy that was rolled out at the end of the 2000s and especially in the 2010s. So Shenzhen was developing, you know, but then it, it was sort of supercharged in the in the 2010s. And so that was it's, it's sort of its own story. I would say that the local industrial policies, it's obviously one of the places, but then um, I would say the most successful places were, I don't know, like Guangzhou, Tianjin, places like that which became these manufacturing hubs by basically luring a bunch of foreign investment. And that's a strategy that we've seen also in smaller countries like Poland and Malaysia. It's been this very successful industrialization strategy at low levels of income of basically just get a bunch of foreign companies with special economic zones and make things for mainly two industries, which are electronics and automotive. And so that has proven to be a very easy sort of replicable, fast industrialization plan, at least in the modern world, uh, as long as you're at low levels of income, it's not clear yet what, like how, how far that plan can take you. Can I ask about that real quick? Because I know you've written about this before, yeah. about kind of there's a, I, I'm going to get the phrasing wrong, but you call it something like a, the quick and easy plan to get to middle income country status, you know, to get to be about as rich as Mexico or Poland or, or something like that, right? And it, it, there's kind of this playbook, and certainly so there's many countries in Asia and and outside of Asia too that that are kind of on this playbook. You could talk about Malaysia potentially. You could talk about China is now middle income. May, maybe even Vietnam or Thailand to some extent are are on this route. I don't know as much about them, but it's kind of trickier, like you said, to move from middle income to like a rich country status where. So probably the only countries in, in East Asia that are at that status now are Japan and, and probably South Korea. Maybe you could throw Taiwan in there, I guess. But it, it seems much harder, much more difficult to really kind of start making your way up the value chain and, and make a lot more complex products and become a rich country. Do you have some sense of like why certain countries in Asia have been able to make that jump and, and other countries are finding it more difficult? Well, one... Uh 
the answer is at this point, I, I just start making stuff up because nobody really knows the answer to this question. And <laughs> there you go. I am not going to stop you at all. You know, everybody, it's a hotly debated <laughs> area of blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, not enough countries have done it for us to really get replicable patterns here. Only a few countries. Many countries have made the jump to, you know, like, I don't know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars of income or even now more making it to thirty thousand dollars. Very few have made it to like the forty, fifty thousand dollar range. And so, you know, you see a big drop off. You see basically just, uh, you know, the developed democracies, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and then and like some petro states, I guess. like I mean, Singapore, obviously, is a city state. You just see like a, a small handful of countries. But I would say that one important thing is strong companies that you saw this with Japan, you saw this with Korea, companies that built very strong brands and did a lot of research in-house. You know, with Korea was the Chebol, you saw especially Samsung, Hyundai, uh, LG, and a couple others. Those companies were extremely pivotal for South Korea. You know, that if you're talking about South Korea being a high-tech superpower, it's not South Korean universities that really drive this. It is Samsung doing research in-house. And if you look at Japan being a high-tech superpower, you do see actually a, a, a good amount of research at Japanese universities, but what you really saw during the 80s, during the 70s and 80s, when Japan, you know, Japan is number one, blah, 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 kind of stuff, it was really companies doing this. And um, and it was some company, consumer companies you've heard of, like Sony and Panasonic, uh, which was then called uh, Matsushita. Yes, it was partly them, and it was partly a bunch of, you know, sort of back-end infrastructure companies you've never heard of. Uh, but Japan was extremely, and it is, is to this day, extremely corporatist. And these big companies were very effective at building brands, which are, is one thing that gives you pricing power. They were very effective at doing in-house research, and they were very effective at developing talent. And so I think that the the value of these large, powerful co corporations that are pretty independent from the government as a way of getting to the final rung of development is understudied and underappreciated. I'd say that we're not corporatist enough in our thinking about development. Uh, and that's the thing that's going to get people to yell at me a lot, but that's just sort of from anecdotal evidence. And I think that with China, you really started to see this with with really one company. Well, you, you saw some IT companies, but then really Huawei was the company that was really starting to go on the same trajectory as, uh, you know, as as... Samsung or, uh, you know, some of these other companies, Panasonic, Sony, whatever, from back in the day, Huawei was really starting to tread down the same path. And then the United States was like, no, you're affiliated with the Chinese spy agency. And so we're going to smack you down and kill you. And we've actually been fairly effective at smacking it down so far. There are so many things I want to ask about there. But the first thing I'm going to say is just, I'm going to, I'm going to take a clip from this episode. I'm going to have Noah saying, uh, we are not corporatist enough. And just cut it right there and uh, get you in real trouble on Twitter.com. That's fine. No, you can you can absolutely do that because honestly, we we undervalue the benefits of these of these big corporations. OK, so I, I want to talk about why China has not gone down this road. But before we go to, to China and what they're doing, it seems to me like there's two potential avenues for why big corporations could be good for middle income countries that are seeking to become high income countries. The first one is kind of a, a political argument that it, it's good for society in general to kind of have competing spheres of power. And, you know, you, you could go all the way back to like the, the English uh, experience of Industrial Revolution, and they had kind of the, the landed gentry, but there was also this growing influential and powerful uh, class of like middle class shopkeepers and, and industrialists who... You know, they, and they played against each other, and it was very beneficial that, you know, there's different forms of power. It seems to me maybe beneficial that there's these kind of, you know, companies that can just be a different source of cultural power, be like a part of civil society that is not the government. I'm curious what you think about that. The second thing that pops into my mind is just trade, that, you know, most of these companies, whether it's Samsung or whether it's Sony – they're doing a significant amount of their business outside of their country that, you know, Samsung didn't get to be what it is by selling to South Korean consumers. You know, it got to be the giant that it is because it sold to the whole world. And I wonder if that's also a part of it that you need not just big companies, but you need big companies that are able to play and succeed in international markets. 
So I don't know. Do you, do you think about it more from a trade perspective or more from a civil society perspective or is it both? Um, I don't know. I mean, like, obviously, so exporting is, is important and everyone realizes that it's important. And there's several ways that it can be important. One way is that it forces companies to essentially, as you said, get out of the cosseted, safe domestic market and go compete in the rough and tumble international market. Some of that's just mechanical. Like if you figure out how to sell to more different kinds of people, you have more different customers and then you make more money. Um, that's part of it. But then part of it is... I'm, I'm jotting this down in my biz, how to run a business 101 notes. How to run a business, <laughs> figure out how to sell to different kinds of more different kinds of customers. And then you broaden your customer base and then you make more money and then your measured productivity goes up. Yay. Um, so that's part of it. But then another part of it is that, you know, if you're competing against a bunch of international multinational companies, you both learn from them. And by the way, most learning comes from hiring people away from other companies. That's how corporate learning happens. You just hire the people from those from the other companies and that's how you learn from them. And so that's really important. So that's that's one thing you do. You learn from these other companies and um, and you import foreign technology and you observe your, your people in your branch offices and your salespeople overseas just observe how all the other companies do it. And it also forces the government to allow importation of foreign technologies in ways that disrupt existing political economic arrangements at home, which it can be very important. Because I think the biggest barrier to development is that incumbent elites resist change in general because they'd rather be a big fish in a small pond than a small fish in a big pond. They're, they want to preserve their relative position by keeping a society in stasis. And this is the biggest barrier to economic development. You know, sort of this pressure to compete with foreign companies uh, can be one thing that helps overcome that a little bit. So I think there's many postulated ways that exporting can really help a country to raise its productivity levels and import foreign technologies and et cetera, et cetera. But the, the fact that it does is pretty well documented. You know, Danny Roderick shows that catch up in productivity among companies and export industries happens much faster than catch up in productivity of industries that serve the domestic market. So for example, retail takes a long time to catch up. You know, I, I lived in Japan for many years and uh, not many, but you know, four years. And then I've been going back there a month out of every year forever. And I will say that in terms of retail, when I first moved to Japan, it looked like the 1950s with these giant department stores with these white gloved elevator operators that just you know, the department store will sell you everything and all the, you know, it was not very efficient and, and grocery stores were not very efficient. And now thanks to one company, I don't know what that company is called, but it's uh, the company that runs Eon, the, uh, the grocery store. It's this, this big retail company They're They're basically making things more Westernized and more efficient. And it's not really Westernized. It's just a, a thing that happened in the West first, uh, by accident. And by the way, that's a, uh, that's an important distinction right there. The idea that, that successful things are specific to the cultures that first discover them is a toxic and poisonous idea in development. The idea that, you know, for example, if you have a grocery store that looks like Safeway, that that's inherently Western instead of just a good way to organize a grocery store. That's sort of a bad toxic idea. The idea that, you know, a Henry Ford type assembly line is Western style of manufacturing back in the, you know, 30s or 40s or whatever that was a toxic idea. And one of the reasons Japan was able to develop ahead of other countries in its region is that it was able to successfully unbundle the idea of foreign techniques and technology from the idea of foreign culture. And there was this expression, which is uh, probably the most significant expression in terms of the culture of Japanese industrialization, which is uh, wakon yosai, which is, you always have to say it like a Japanese narrator. Wakon yosai. Um, that, that's the... Uh, the Japanese equivalent of the like trailer guy. Imagine a world where, you know, <laughs> anyway, but Wakon Yosai was basically Japanese spirit, uh, Western things. Um, and what that basically meant was we're going to take these, these methods of industrialization and these methods of, you know, these technologies and these methods of business organization and these methods of production and et cetera, et cetera, and these methods of doing taxation, these methods of building roads, and these methods of building an army, and blah, 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 blah. We're going to do all these things, but we're going to retain our essential Japanese-ness and our essential Japanese character. And that was partly bullshit, because um, 
Partly what happens is modernization, economic and technological modernization changes a lot of countries in the same way. There's convergent evolution of everywhere because uh, they discover best practice. So partly that was bullshit, but partly it was true. You know, if you look at Japan, it's uh, it's recognizably n not Western in many ways. And in fact, even different from the other countries in East Asia in substantial ways. You know, it's it, it managed to retain a lot of cultural uniqueness despite modern economic stuff. And that's pretty cool. And I think that's one thing that people really like about it. So it wasn't complete bullshit. It was part of that was true. You know, Wakon Yosai really did work. And so this uh, that idea is the one of the most important ideas in development because foreign business practices and institutions and infrastructure and technology get resisted partly because of of this sort of cultural defensiveness. We'll lose our traditional culture. We'll become westernized, right? Um yeah, and in yeah. fact, there there even are some right wingers in Japan who, to this day, think that you know Japan has become just looks just like America. You know, there, there was this guy, this old old professor who had actually done his PhD at Stanford, uh, who who said that you know Japan looks like America now. He said to me as we were looking on a vista of uh, I was like, no, no, it does not. It really doesn't. <laughs> Take him to the suburbs outside of San Francisco and see. Right, if like nothing. Like yeah. Thank God Japan doesn't look but like yeah, that. Yeah, no, I I think it's a I think it's a good idea what you're saying that, you know, I kind of presented this as two separate ideas that there's, you know, exports and there's cultural change, but really they're kind of they they can cause one another in in a sense. Cultural change can cause you to want to export more, and an exporting company can cause your power centers of your culture to change. And you know, you you, you talked about the Japanese example, you know, I think it's like at the Meiji restoration where they kind of emerged from the isolationist period and they had this gung-ho attitude towards like let's let's get a bunch of foreign ideas in here and modernize. I also think about like South Korea, you know, which was a later stage, but South Korea um their their first dictator post Korean War basically dragging uh executives into his office and saying if you don't export I will throw you and your families in jail. And then doing it sometimes, like you have Park Chung Hee, that's right. Yeah, you have to have success, not domestically. You have to have success internationally, or it, if I don't see you hitting your export quotas, I will throw you in jail for a week to motivate you. Which, like, I'm not going to excuse authoritarianism, but like, I it worked kind of, maybe. Like, I don't know, <laughs> but yeah, it it's a thing well. that happened. I guess I don't know. Yeah, it, that that's right. That's right. And so I think that leads us into the China question, because I, I promised you I would come back to this and why we don't see that in China. I, I think two things strike me. You you brought up Huawei, which is, you know, they're uh, they're kind of uh, like a tech company and it's a um, they make they're involved in like a bunch of things in, in like mobile and and uh, 5G and chip making. Maybe I don't know if they're chip makers. I might be making that up. Huawei makes some of their own chips. That's right. They're involved. They've got their hands in a lot of pots. They're kind of a national champion, and there's there's some sense that there's some sense that the Western world is resisting this. We are just refusing to trade with Huawei at this point. But the right the thing that strikes me even more than that, though, is that you don't actually get this impact of like, oh well, you know, when Samsung and and Hyundai and uh, all, all these other Korean companies emerge that there's kind of this natural counterbalance to the state. It's a, it's an independent power center that very much has not happened in China. The CCP controls all of these companies. And you see when they try to get a little bit independent and, you know, Jack Ma says, I don't think the regulation is very good. We should change it. He disappears for six months and no one sees him and he's forced to sell his company, you know, at Alibaba which is another tech giant in China, you know, like they basically like, I, like the, the form of cancel culture that, that exists with like torture and guns seems to have happened to Jack Ma. Um, I, like that seems like a, a much bigger problem to me rather than just the West saying we're not going to trade with Huawei. It's like these, these companies are not allowed to like f become independent power centers. They're essentially just arms of the communist government. That's right. And um, but notice that they cracked down hard on Tencent as well, even though, you know, Tencent, unlike Alibaba, never showed an ounce of desire for independence. You know, Tencent and uh, and also Baidu, you know, like these companies basically said, you know, Jack Ma tried to be a little bit independent. And so, of course, they cracked down on him for that reason. But I think people get distracted by that. 
I think what really happened was that China, China's leaders decided, okay, we're, we don't want to become a country that specializes in IT. We don't want to become giant Estonia. They were never really in any danger of becoming giant Estonia. But what was happening is that all the top, you know, young, smart grads in China wanted to go work for Tencent instead of Huawei. Can I just say, I giant Estonia is going to enter my lexicon, by the way, yeah. now. <laughs> giant Estonia. I mean, like you can't, like Estonia does pretty well for itself. In fact, I should, should write a post about that. East Europe is a great software cluster and it's, uh, you know, software is just a lot less labor intensive than manufacturing and maybe less subject to clustering effects because it's remote, you can transmit it really easily. And that's a bit of a sidetrack. But what happened was that China, China's leaders, in addition to not liking Jack Ma, you know, nobody, nobody cared about Pony Ma. Can I, um, can, can I ask you one, I'm going to, I'm going to follow that sidetrack for just one second. I promise we'll get right back to it. Go ahead, go ahead. But, but I have to get your take on this. What odds would you put that in the next 20 years, one of the Eastern European countries has like a higher GDP per capita than the UK, like Poland or Estonia or so? Well, given the way the UK is going, I'm pretty, I'm pretty positive about that. Um, I mean, like the low bar, low, you compared it to the UK. I think there's a chance that, you know, 25 years from now, we're hearing about like low income people from the UK moving to Poland for better wages. That's right. <laughs> Anyway, sorry, well, let's get back. You're talking about uh, some other uh, Pony Ma. Pony Ma, do you know who that is? I do not. Pony Ma is the, guy, is the founder of Tencent. So it's, it's, it's just a bunch of Ma guy. It's Jack Ma, it's Pony Ma. It, it, it's, it's a couple Ma, no relation. It's just it's uh, the Ma gang. It's the Ma's. They're, they're, I, don't, I don't think they're related. You know, you never heard of him because he just sucks up to the Chinese state. I don't even know who founded Baidu, actually, because they, they're just some gray, faceless people who suck up to the Chinese state. And China was still cracking down on these companies. Didi was, you know, obviously an arm of the Chinese state, and they were still cracking down on uh, Didi, which is the, just the Chinese Uber clone, right? And so um, why were they cracking down on these uh, these companies? It wasn't just to eliminate it, uh, or even primarily to eliminate an alternative center of power. It was because China was worried that, uh, that too much talent was flowing into these companies, and that instead it wanted that talent to flow into hardware. Basically, there's this sort of boomer idea that hardware is real power, you know, software is bullshit. This is this is Trump yelling about U.S. steel and how we don't build anything anymore. Kind of. That's right. That's right. She is much more Trumpian than you realize. Uh, she is a guy whose dad, you know, and well, really his mom got him uh, connections. You know, he 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 really failed his classes. He he was one of the princelings. He he was you know. The, there's this phrase in China: the the princelings, the children of like the the important people in like like. There's a cadre of important people for the first right. 10 years of Mao's rule. And exactly. Xi Jinping's father was one of those. And what's funny is he was actually like thrown out of power and exiled and, and he died in shame or whatever. But she still kind of uh, it was was I guess the, I guess he didn't imprison the child, too. So, Right. Although she she did live some of his youth in a cave, making him. The only major world leader, to my knowledge, that has been an actual caveman uh, now that Osama <laughs> bin Laden is no longer with us. <laughs> um, well, no, the, I guess whoever's in charge of Afghanistan now may have also been a caveman at some point. But uh, but she is a, is a caveman and he's um, he's got a little bit of, of caveman to him. Uh, he's I mean, I, I don't I don't even think of him as Trumpian as much as like Stalinist. Like I look at she and I think about. No, he's not. Stalinist. I think I. I think he is genuinely Stalinist. He has some of the same talents as Stalin. So Stalin's main talent was just building, was was taking over an existing big organization, Communist Party, by turning it into a personalist gang. Yeah. And she has that skill. He has well, that same the, skill. His whole theory, like, of, of why the Soviet Union collapsed is that they got too soft. They started allowing reforms. They lost their taste for, like, cracking down. And, you know, basically that abandoning Stalinism was the wrong move as far back as like Khrushchev. Right. And, and, and that was a that was actually a popular Chinese line at the time. Like this isn't Xi's idea. This is something Mao said at the time. Yeah. But so at, I, but Stalinist in his political ambitions of just building a personalized state, you know, but then also like he, he seems much more like five year planny to me than than like because Trump's steel stuff is really just vibes he really just wants like what steel represents. Complete whereas vibes. she, yeah. Whereas she thinks I see him more as like, well, we just have to build this X number of microchips and X amount of steel and X and like it, it gives me very five year plan kind of Soviet vibes to be honest. Uh, Barry Naughton, the premier, probably the premier Western scholar of Chinese industrial policy, has written a good short book on how Chinese industrial policy has changed. And basically, 
it started changing in the late years of the Hu Jintao period. And then, it, but it really intensified under Xi Jinping, especially um, in 2015. And that was the shift from this local regional industrial policy to a nationalized industrial policy, where basically now the government, the, the central government is going to tell us to you know, tell people what to do and, um, and throw huge amounts of money at it. And it's been pretty unsuccessful, to be honest. Uh, a couple studies have shown that the, the companies and the industries that got the money thrown at them ended up doing a little bit worse. And that's not just positive. I mean, like, you know, it could just be, uh, you know, there could be reverse causation here. It could be that just, you know, they were trying to shore up these failing companies, but probably not. Probably what happened is that this is that there's something like a resource curse with these subsidies, where basically these companies that suddenly Xi Jinping was throwing huge amounts of money at their head. They were like, ah, money, ha <laughs> we don't need to innovate. Um, and so trying to do this industrial policy via subsidies, massive subsidies, was probably a bad idea. And then Xi Jinping's other sort of innovation, which is to do industrial policy by subtraction, to basically smash the tech industries and the real estate industries in the hope that talent and money would then flow to the stuff he really wants. That was even worse. That was just an absolute disaster. Do they seem to have realized that? Because it seems yeah. like they've started to ease up on the like, hey, we're not going to be cracking down anymore. And it's hard to know when you only speak English and you have to kind of rely on like secondhand reporting on some of these sources. But it seems like they realize like we did an oopsie to some extent. That's right. That's right. Yeah, they're they're trying to they're trying to backpedal now and it's just not clear what's going to replace that. I think that what you see right now is a charm offensive. I'm going to write about this soon. China's going on a charm offensive, starting with international finance people. And, you know, in 2018, Xi was presenting China as a champion of globalization. That changed during, and, and he was not actually acting as a champion of globalization because China was was working, you know, the Made in China 2025 initiative was in full swing. Um, and China was, uh, the, the Thousand Talents program was trying to lure Chinese people back from overseas. Um, and then the uh, China was trying to onshore all its supply chain. So it was being very sort of economic nationalist in the 2010s, but pretending to be this champion of free trade uh, because that allowed it to score points against the idiotic Trump administration in international sort of opinion. They're trying to go back to that. They're, they're not really becoming pro-globalist, but they're talking up a game about pro-globalism and they're starting with... And what they're doing is they're going to the finance companies and saying, hey, come invest in China you can make some money here as long as you, you know, as long as you yell about, um, you know, how like decoupling is so bad and the United States industrial policy is so bad and the, the you know, all this stuff. And they're, they're succeeding with that. You see that, uh, that Hank Paulson wrote an op-ed in foreign affairs the other day saying, we know we, we don't need protectionism. We need to go back to globalization. We can't just get rid of China. You know, of course, um, U.S. efforts have not been an attempt to get rid of China just to get rid of the Chinese semiconductor industry, basically. Yeah, so you're seeing this big push, and they're trying to essentially suborn, maybe that's the wrong word, maybe that's too strong a word, but they're essentially trying to suborn U.S. and European finance companies, and, and also the economic elites, the Davos people who are, who, whose money comes from saying things to banks, you know, talking up a game to banks. And those, those sort of intellectual people who are, you know, like, consultants and and private bank economists and like you know occasional like members of international economic institutions yeah uh who's basically who gives speeches to banks and that's how they make their money and so they're china's trying to basically get those people and to get the the investment banks and to get the finance people and this is how they're doing their charm offensive because they realized that the tack that they were on that they started in 2020 and went through basically 2022 uh, of those three years, they made a misstep. They realized they they screwed up. And they screwed up with this sort of subtractive industrial policy of smashing the industries they didn't like. They're backpedaling on that. And they screwed up with the wolf warrior diplomats and sort of bellowing at everybody. And so they're, they're saying, okay, well, things were going pretty good in 2018. Why don't we just rewind to 2018 and pretend that the last three years didn't happen? <laughs> <laughs> There's an old rule in online discussions that I really like. And it's like you've what you say has to either be kind or it has to be correct. Um, and it, like, if, if you're going to be unkind, you'd better be right. You better have your facts straight. And if you're going to be wrong, you better at least have been nice in being wrong. Because if you're an asshole and you're wrong, that's when people hate you. 
And it seems to me like China's kind of running into this economically that, number one, they were kind of an asshole to the whole world for a little while. And they did a bunch of horrible stuff in, in Hong Kong and in Xinjiang that made everybody very leery of them and think that they were awful. And, right. you know, you, you can do that as long as your internal economic policy is, is succeeding wildly. If you're growing at 8 to 10 percent a year, every single year, it doesn't really matter what the world thinks of you. Right. But if your internal economic policy starts to falter and you start to mess up and now you've for some reason you've smashed all your biggest companies for for no discernible reason and now the rest of the world hates you, that's when you're in trouble. Right. And so they were obviously in trouble and they're trying to backtrack. And this that backtrack will be the big theme of 2023. As far as China's concerned, you know, 2022 was the 2021 was the year of overreach. 2022 was the year when sort of the bill came due for the overreach. And 2023 will be the year of the backtrack. And what's really going to be the theme of, of 2023 and many of the years moving forward is trade policy and not just China's trade policy, but U.S. trade policy. And trade policy in, in the region as a whole, I think, you had a really good piece around friend shoring. And, you know, had, the U.S. has taken a protectionist turn recently. And some of it you could say maybe is smart. You know, I, I am not a protectionist. I rarely say anything protectionism is smart. But I do understand the case for, you know, uh, trying to shut down like China's semiconductor industry. There's a national security argument there. And I can, I can be OK with that, you know, under the right circumstances. Some of the U.S. protectionist lean is just dumb that we're, you know, doing shit with Canada's lumber that makes no sense or whatever. But U.S. trade policy is is a big deal right now. How would you summarize the idea that, you know, what number one, what the U.S. is doing and and what they should be doing? Because you wrote about this with friend shoring. Mm, yeah. So, right. This this idea that the U.S. can go it alone is not an idea Trump made up. But it's an idea Trump latched onto because it's an old and stupid idea, and Trump latches onto every idea that's old and stupid. Um, and it is an idea that that the Biden administration people have to a small degree or to some degree because they haven't stopped to question it, they haven't stopped to think about it, and they haven't been able to think of it in a different context. And so my goal will be to try to get in touch with them and try to get them to think of it in a different context. Because the if you look at you know the United States has never faced. A, an opponent like China, which has dwarfs us in size. You know, the Soviet Union was a little bit bigger than us, but, you know, the Eastern Bloc, we still outnumbered the Eastern Bloc. And they were far, uh, you know, they were far less efficient. So is China. Um, but then they, um, but they were just far, they, they didn't have the size that China has. China has four times our people. And I don't think that that's that the import of that has sunk in. And this, the is, only, this is almost the, the Matt Iglesias argument uh, in One Billion Americans. That, yeah, but uh, One Billion Americans yeah, isn't yeah. happening soon. And yeah, well, but but it's the argument he makes about why size matters, basically. Yes, that's right. And he is right. And people focus too much on the title where, where they really should be, should be focusing on the direction of the argument. But that aside, uh, you know, this this century, if we if we pump up immigration, blah, 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 we might reach 500 million Americans, but we're still outnumbered, you know, more than, you know, two and a half, we'll be, out, be outnumbered two and a half to one by China in the very best scenario. And so we're a, we're a small country compared to China. We're small. We haven't, we need to get used to being small. We've never been small before. We've always been big compared to our uh, adversaries or at least equal sized. You know, the, the communist bloc, we were about equal size with them. And then uh, we really overmatched in terms of size. We really overmatched Germany and Japan and Britain, sort of our, our, our rivals of, of yesteryear. And we've never faced an opponent like China, which is just bigger than us. And we we need to convert to a different strategy. Of course, one thing we need to do, if you're bigger, one thing you can do is be more efficient. But that's not all we can do. We have to do a lot more than that. We have to get a big gang together. And that gang has to include both developed democracies like the you know countries of Europe and the Pacific Rim. But in addition, it has to include a lot of developing countries too. And it's going to have to include India. And it should include countries like Indonesia. Um, but it's going to definitely 100%. It's going to have to include India. We need India on our side. Um, not, I, I'm not just talking about militarily because I don't necessarily think that's how it's going to go. But I think in terms of an economic block, we need India in our economic block. We need to make sure India develops. We need to have good trade relations with India. And this whole 
paradigm we've learned, this protectionist paradigm we've learned of, oh my God, the jobs are going overseas and blah, blah, blah. So we can't trade with any of these poor countries because actually they're just cheating with their low labor standards and their low environmental standards and blah, blah, blah. They're cheating and all sweatshops and blah, blah, blah. And all, the, all these instincts that we learned made sense when we we're talking about China in the 2000s. And they didn't really make sense when we were talking about like Indonesia in the 1990s. They made sense in Ch for China in the 2000s. They don't make sense for China anymore because China has leveled up past that that stage. But they they don't make sense for for India and for these countries. And, and we need to get out of this mindset. So what we need to do, it, it's this interesting sort of balance because we need it, it does behoove us to do a lot of this industrial policy we're doing and to take measures against, uh, you know, like Chinese semiconductor industry for security reasons. But at the same time. We need to be opening our markets to India. And that's a thing that just breaks people's brains. It, people don't understand that. Let me let me ask you to elaborate there, because you said, you know, I, I know you're an, a proponent of industrial policy sometimes, but that doesn't mean all industrial policy is good. So could you elaborate, like, what would, but here's a way to frame it, like, what would a stupid counterproductive industrial policy be doing versus what would a smart industrial policy be doing for the United States, like in your view? Um, a smart industrial policy will uh, will focus on uh, sort of industry clustering and exports. So I think that the United States doesn't export enough. We're at a disadvantage because we're a large we have a large domestic economy, so it's very very easy to just sell to Americans. So we need to promote exports, and we need to uh, you know focus on specific high tech industries of strategic concern. We're actually doing a good job on the second one of these. We're focusing on the semiconductor industry which we need to, we're focusing on AI, which we need to, we are focusing on, um, you know, sort of the electric vehicle industry, which I think ultimately we will not have leadership in that industry, but we will have an important presence in that industry, which is all we really need. Um, and I could go into more of that later. Uh, but semiconductors are, you know, are, are very important. Uh, you know, AI is going to be important. So these strategic things we're focusing on, these are, these are important and good, and we're doing that. What we're not doing is focusing on exporting. The United States needs to focus on exports, promoting exports. And a lot of that's going to be reciprocal. You know, we, we tend to think in terms of net exports and the trade surpluses or deficits. That's not as important. Everyone thinks about that balance, whereas that balance is not as important as gross exports. We just need to sell more stuff overseas, even if we also buy more stuff from overseas. Because a lot of the stuff we buy from overseas is going to be intermediate components used to make the stuff that we then sell overseas. Because that's how supply chains work. Nobody's thinking in these terms yet. Everybody's thinking in terms of net exports, trade deficits. We're losing, says Trump. We're losing because we have a trade deficit. No, forget about the net. We need to talk about the gross, the total exports. We need to sell more stuff overseas for all the reasons we've been talking about before. Because we're this big country and it's really, really easy for companies to just look inward and just think of America equals the world. But America is not the world. The existence of China means that we are now actually a small country. And as a small country, we need to export, export, export. And so that's the that's you know a message I need to drive home. It's really interesting you say that because a lot of people who want industrial policy are trying to restrict trade. They're trying to reduce the importance of trade. And you're saying we need to trade more, just higher volumes of both exports and imports would be good for us. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, and so we need to we need to export more. It doesn't matter if we import more as long, you know, as long as we're importing from friendly countries. That's called French shoring. And we need to export more, period, no matter where we export to. And so that's how we need to think about this. So we need more trade. Um, we need to become a more open economy to become a more competitive economy. And we need to stop thinking America equals the world or we'll just build everything by ourselves. And, you know, frankly, a lot of the people in the Biden administration advising the Biden administration need to get into this mindset of, you know, America needs a gang and we need to export more. And this internationalist mindset, you need to marry strategic concerns and you need to marry industrial policy with an internationalist mindset, not from a, a nationalist isolated isolationist mindset. And that's a very difficult message to get across because it's just not how we've grown used to thinking about these issues in the past. It's always been industrial policy is just a facet of protectionism and, and one country nationalism and go it aloneism. But no, right. So you're exactly right. It's a, it's a, it's a weird way to think. We need to shift people toward it somehow. 
do you think what America's doing is in that direction? Because there, there's a lot of people who are complaining about it, obviously. China's not happy about it, to, to be obvious. But even some of our allies, like in Europe, uh, ha have been like, this is a, these, you know, parts of the Inflation Reduction Act are a betrayal of your allies, you know, because it's, it's some sort of industrial policy that they think might disadvantage their companies or something like that. Do you think that their complaints have any validity? That that is the U.S. going about it in the wrong way, or is this kind of just sour grapes? Um, this is there's always going to be jostling like this among allies. I mean, even the the European countries within the EU fight each other over this kind of stuff, and we need to work these things out and have regular forums that we can work these things out. We need to have regular forums where we get together with the people from Korea, with the people from France, and work and work out how our subsidies will apply to their stuff. And we need to demonstrate respect. The United States is terrible at demonstrating respect for other countries. We are very good at doing things that materially benefit other countries. We are terrible at the symbolic game of expressing respect for other countries. We need to get better at that. Fortunately, China is even worse than us. But, um, you know, and, and this comes from being a big country. This is This is big country disease. Small countries have to express respect every day, just as a matter of course, big countries don't get that luxury. Uh, or big countries have the luxury, I'm sorry, small countries don't have the luxury of just, you know, pretending that, you know, we're just not dealing with anybody else. We have to learn how to respect countries more. And this is especially, especially important when dealing with India and countries that were formerly colonized and have very good reason to suspect that, that they're being disrespected. In fact, you know, one of the reasons Japan became such an aggressive empire was that they feel they felt that they weren't being respected in the, you know, World War I treaties and 1920s naval treaties and things like that. Um, they felt that they were being disrespected. And of course, they were, you know, the imperial Japanese imperialists were complete jerks and assholes and bad people. But um, but, you know, they <laughs> certainly there was this idea of of respect for countries that weren't part of the first wave of industrialization. And I don't think the United States has has really understood this yet. We need to understand this, especially in the context of India. We need to find, this is just pure rhetoric. We need to find ways to respect these, to show that we respect these countries more. Fortunately, China just disrespects everybody just as complete jerks. I'm, I'm reminded of those sad but funny border clashes they have with India where everybody's agreed not to use guns. And so instead they like, they, it's like it's like a scene out of like that movie Gangs from New York where they all have like sticks with nails in them and stuff like that. And they're like beating each other. Some of them are dying, but they've agreed not to use guns, I guess, because they can't stop from fighting in this weird Himalayan outpost. And so you literally have a mob of people beating each other with sticks. And uh, that that's China-India relations at the moment, I think. Yes, exactly. It's Gangs of New York and the Himalayas. So l let's talk about the future because... Yeah. We're talking a little bit about, about the policy, and I, I've always been kind of bearish on China in particular it, for, for several reasons, just that, you know, I, I think their growth is going to slow down because I, I don't think Xi Jinping is capable of, of maintaining that 8% growth forever. I, I think they're sitting on a demographic time bomb that, you know, in some ways is going to be even worse than what we, we think of in like Japan. And, and that's another thing, if you want to get into that, why Japan's demographics are not as bad as everybody else's. But are, are how do you see, you know, the next few, the next decade going for China or for Japan or, or for the region in general? Are you, are you optimistic about kind of the, the Japan, South Korea, Taiwan uh, trio? Are you optimistic about, you know, from a Chinese perspective, do you think that they'll be able to come out of this pretty well? Well, so regarding Japan, I don't really know. Japan is sort of in a, in a leftist phase, like leftist ideas are, are really rising in Japan. You know, everyone's reading these sort of anti-capitalist books and, you know, that's, uh, that's the intellectual trend in Japan is toward leftist ideas. Uh, and I don't think that's necessarily going to help a lot, but I think that it's probably natural given how much inequality and poverty have increased there. Uh, so then I think that, um, you know, Japan, Japan could use a bit more redistribution, absolutely, and a bit more, uh, a better social safety net, but really what it needs is growth. And essentially, nobody in Japan is thinking about how to do growth. And so I've got to switch their minds on that. Fortunately, I think the people who run Japan read my blog. And so that's, uh, you know, I've got to. Um, have you gotten indicators of that before? Like, oh, have yeah. you like. I've been told that explicitly. 
Spill the tea. Spill the tea. I want to hear this. Oh, no. I mean, people in the Japanese government said that I'm I'm sort of the, the pundit that they read uh, because I'm not obviously just a Japan basher or just a Japan, you know, defender or whatever. You're the English language p- pundit that they read. Yeah. I'm the English language pundit they read. And um, once or twice I've I've recommended I've made some like tiny little recommendation that then I saw got done. And so I was like, hmm, perhaps a bureaucrat read my blog and was like, oh, we can make this little change. What, was that a weird day when that happened? I have to imagine that's kind of bizarre it, when something like that happens. It was bizarre. It was also bizarre when I saw my name in an anime. <laughs> when someone decided to make a character named Noah Smith in an anime. <laughs> I, I don't know where this character arc is leading, but I am in favor of it. That's all. I'm yeah, gonna say. I was very surprised, and I it was it was it was gratifying that the character was just a sexy foreign exchange student, and that was the entire like it was just a bit character who was in it for like five minutes. <laughs> and they were like, "Well, you know, we we can't get people to come on our trip if if Noah Smith's not going. Nobody's going to come." And then, <laughs> like I was like, "Hmm." So I, I'm you know I'm I'm sure it's just someone who had seen my blog and was just trying to think of a generic American name, and so just grabbed my name. Um, but then that's, that's, you know, someone, someone's out there reading. I don't, I don't think like, you know, prime minister Kishida is like reading my blog every day. That's not happening. Uh, maybe someday, but, um, but I think that there are probably some people in the bureaucracy, uh, read my blog or yeah, there's people in the, just, you know, some bureaucrats stuck in the ministry somewhere are reading my blog. That's useful. So, so I'm going to try to think about growth and how Japan can promote growth, but really that's a question for a lot of countries, you know, Britain and Italy are obviously in the same boat, right? Italy's even worse. Uh, they're sort of these undeveloping countries where you had these, they were, they were, their development was supercharged for a while on top of the world. And now their economic models are kind of waning and they're losing ground. Um, Italy's lost more ground than the others, but you, you know, you've read all the, the doomerism about UK. Um, UK is not doing quite as bad as people think, but it's not doing great either. It's uh, pretty stagnant. So, um, I need to think about like Japan, the UK and, and Italy, how they can, how these so-called undeveloping countries, I say so-called, but I made up that term, um, how they can sort of restore growth. I'm not like some industrial policy genius, but, but it may be that no one is right. So I've got to think about this, but I don't also don't want to be taken for like a guru or an expert. And the problem is everyone's looking for a guru, you know? Do you think that Abenomics, like, you know, Shinzo Abe's kind of ideas of, there, there were like three big pillars, I remember. One of them was bring women into the workforce. One of them was monetary policy, I think. But do you think that that was pointed in the right direction, even if it it, it didn't get all, all the way that it wanted to, all the things, it didn't accomplish everything it was trying to do? But do you think it was a the right move at the time? Sure. You know, Japan um, did a couple big things in the 2010s. Japan did several big things. Number one, loose monetary policy, which is now coming to an end. Um, but, it, it, well, somewhat coming to an end. It, it'll still, you know, be, be there to some degree. Um, that helped a lot. Getting women into the workforce. They only managed to increase the percent of women in management by a moderate amount, but then they managed to increase the percent of women workers by quite a lot. And now uh, Japan has more more Japanese women are employed than American women. Um, so that was a big success because you were underutilizing your, you know, half your population. And now you're not and you're still underutilizing them, but in a qualitative, not quantitative sense, if that makes any sense. Um, and so that was, you know, that was a major change. Um, and then immigration, they really stepped up immigration a lot in the 2010s which is something that somehow people don't realize because of the stereotype of like closed off xenophobic Japan, blah, blah, blah. No, shut up. Well, I mean, to, to be fair, like that they earned that for a while, even if it's not true anymore. Like sure, they, they I, did. I feel like they've fairly earned that. Right. But. And when you start for a low base and, and, you know, so like right now, what you see is that people a few years ago, people were like, oh yeah, Japan, only 1%, you know, why do you think it's so open? Only 1% of its population was born overseas whatever. And now they're like, oh, Japan, you think it's so open? Only 3% of its population was born overseas. I'm like, that tripled, you dumbass. <laughs> How does that compare to other countries, though? Like, if you compare that to South Korea or China or Taiwan, some of the neighbors, is Japan actually starting to pull ahead or are they still playing catch up? They're pu- uh, they're pulling ahead of their neighbors in this sense. Uh, they're way behind the European countries. But one thing that people don't understand about European countries is that, uh, like, so much of the European, like, foreign-born stuff is just from the Schengen area, is just from the fact that... Um, I was I was born in Switzerland, and now I live in France, kind of thing. 
something like that. I was born in Poland. Now I live in the UK, uh, which doesn't have that anymore. But anyway, um, yeah. So then like a lot of, uh, a lot of people just move around from European country to country. Um, honestly, a lot of these people on working holiday or blah, blah, blah. Europe's borders are porous. Europe has always been a little bit like this since the days of, you know, Holy Roman Empire or something. There are some other regions that are like that a little bit too, but I we won't go into that. I guess the point is that, um, you know, people compare Japan to Europe when the Japan is more like Europe than people realize in this sense. And people think that Europe is this incredibly pro-immigrant place because of the Schengen area. Um, but the, people compare Japan, you know, we comparing Japan to its neighbors. Japan is, is right there with the others. I mean, I, it's, it's about the same as Korea. I think in terms of foreign born population, Korea is also ramping up immigration a bit. China is not, and Taiwan is not, although they really need to. Yeah, but Japan needs more. Japan needs to reform its corporate uh, situation. And it did try. Like in the 2010s, it came out with this corporate governance code, tried to increase shareholder power, uh, blah, blah, blah. And that has had some effect. And I think that it will have some effect in the future. But I think that Japan needs to promote exports more than it's doing. And a lot of these countries need to promote exports. Now, here's a here's an important thing. It is possible for all countries to promote exports at once and have everybody win from that. Does that sound like a weird assertion to you? I mean, I, I was an econ major, so I, I understand the logic behind it. But I, I also Got get it. why it's counterintuitive to right. a lot of people. You know, Because that, people are thinking in terms of net exports, because people think imports are a loss. Mm. Uh, uh, they, th they think in zero-sum terms. They know? think in zero-sum terms. Economics does not have to be zero-sum. That's why right. economic growth exists. But yeah, right. it's a natural human tendency to think in zero-sum terms sometimes. That's right. And so people think in terms of net uh not in terms of growth. So if I sell, and, and by the way, this is Krugman's new trade theory. Krugman wrote this theory about how it can benefit com countries to sell exactly the same sort of products to each other, right? So America sells Japan cars and Japan sells America cars and everybody's better off for it. And, you know, Krugman didn't have this thing where pushing your countries to go outside makes you improve productivity faster. But if you add that, then you, you know, that's an extra reason. So, for example, if American car companies sell cars only to Americans and Japanese car companies sell cars only to Japanese people, then there's probably a lot of innovations that they each come up with that they won't see from each other. But if Japan sells car, if Japan and America both compete in a combined Japan America car market where Americans buy cars from both and Japanese people buy cars from both, then you know you could have net exports of cars be exactly the same, no change in the zero sum game of trade deficits and surpluses, but you could see big productivity gains and you could see, uh, you know, from various sources. And so my message is don't worry about the imports. Don't be afraid of the imports, pump up the exports. Last question, because we're running up on time before we get out of here. But how do you think about the, the Chinese decade coming up? Do you think that China's going to have any success in kind of trying to play nice with the rest of the world? Do you think their demographic time bomb is going to hit them as badly as I do? Um, like, what, what's your general sense in terms of are, are you bearish, bullish, you know, hot or cold on, on China's immediate future? So China's demographic time bomb is not going to hit them nearly as hard as people think. It is not. It, China won't just go poof just because their population is shrinking. Japan didn't, right? Japan's population has been shrinking since the 2000s. Like, Japan just has not disappeared. You know, it instead just, it, it produces like a, a a sort of a constant drag. Um, but it's not, it's not like a, like they won't just vaporize. You know, they'll, they won't crash, blah, blah, blah. It just, it just creates a drag. And by far the bigger drags on China than, than the demographics. I mean, the, the drags are one, one part, by the way. And by the way, China's total population isn't important as the young working age population. So what you see is that the, the 18 through 29 year olds in China already fell off a cliff years ago. China is, has many fewer young people, young workers than it used to in terms of absolute numbers. And so the demographic stuff is already exerting a big drag uh, as you know, a, a drag. And so as you, the drag exerts itself in subtle ways as sort of old people build up their positions in management and everything. And you get this gerontocracy where nobody's willing to entertain new ideas and blah, blah, blah. That's a real thing. But uh, I would not, I, I'm not, 
I, I think we should not expect demographic drag to be nearly as big a deal as people make it out to be in China. Uh, as for China's charm offensive, we'll, um, that's an open question. I think a lot, you know, I can't really predict one way or another, but I think that when you crush Hong Kong and spend a couple of years bellowing the ear of the new hegemon or whatever, and when you, you know, basically fight with India and claim all this territory from Southeast Asia and the South China Sea, and when you do all this crap, especially if you invade Taiwan, like nobody's fooled, you know, like... Yes, you can get Goldman Sachs to be like, mm, we could get some Chinese money if we say nice things about China, blah, 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 blah. That's Goldman Sachs, right? Like, And so I, I think China's charm offensive will probably be less successful than they hope, but it might be successful to some degree. And uh, so we'll see about that. I think that essentially we're seeing the, the biggest change is that China will not have fast growth, but I think that we will see a period where China sort of bumps back up to like four or even four and a half percent growth for like four, you know, maybe three or four years. And people are like, China's back. Fast growth is back. Blah, blah, blah. In fact, this happened with Japan in the late eighties. And this is when everyone thought, you know, so China's got room for like another, uh, another bubble of, of enthusiasm before it really settles down to, to permanent slow developed country growth rates. That's my prediction. All right. Well, we will have to see how it turns out. I'm now going to ask the final question that we always ask on this podcast, All and right. that is, where should people go to learn more? If they're interested in what we're talking about, um, I will obviously recommend your blog, No Opinion. It's great. It talks about a number of things. There's a wide range of topics, but you know, East Asian countries and development are certainly two of those topics that feature prominently. But if people are just interested in the wide variety of stuff we're talking about, whether it's China, Japan, development... Is, are, are there any sources you would point them to? Books, blogs, oh, yeah. anything at all? Oh, absolutely. Um, in terms of, of uh, China development stuff, there's a consultancy called Macro Polo run by my friend Damien Ma, or not a consultancy, it's a, I'm sorry, it's a think tank, uh, run by Damien Ma called Macro Polo. Nice pun there. Um, and that follows China stuff. So I definitely pay attention to that. Always read Dan Wong on sort of industrial policy stuff. Um, Barry Naughton is a great source. Um, there's a bunch of like so-called China hands that follow China. Uh, Li Chan Ren is a good one. Victor Xi. Uh, Shuli Ren of Bloomberg is absolutely great to read about this stuff. Um, great columnist. Probably the, the best China economics columnist uh, in existence. I would say is Shuli Ren of Bloomberg. Um, no relation to uh, Li Chan Ren. It's the Rens versus the Ma's here. Uh, you know, Bill Bishop is sort of a, a breaking news newsletter. You know, like anything that happens related to China, he'll sort of pick up on. I have a list on Twitter of China news if you just want to follow news related to China. And that's sort of, those are sort of where I'd start. And then in terms of papers, there's a lot of good papers that come out. Just, you know, Google like NBER China and look at the most recent papers in NBER. And you'll just find a lot of good stuff. People really discount the ability of economists to follow China's economy and understand it, right? Economists are learning a lot more than people realize about what's going on in China. All right. Well, I think, it, like I said, it continues to be one of the most fascinating regions in the world for the obvious reasons of that's where the people live, for the economic development stories that are taking place there, for the political implications of China's rise and the China versus U.S. trade war. All of this continues to fascinate me, will continue to fascinate both of us, I imagine, into the foreseeable future. Uh, Noah Smith, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me on. Great to talk as always.